the most terrible and serious weapon is a human himself. But fortunately, he doesn't even suspect that. Anastasia Novich. What is a human least knowledgeable in? Himself and his own abilities. And the world around us keeps concealing many undiscovered mysteries as well. But the most paradoxical thing is that this doesn't prevent us, people, from using those powers and energies which we so far know very little about. Electricity, for example. Scientists are still unable to answer the question of what is the basis of electricity and what it actually is. Although, back in the late 19th and the early 20th centuries, we knew much more about it than we do now. Besides, there is numerous evidence that in ancient times people had more advanced knowledge than we do. We can still observe echoes of this unusual knowledge and skills nowadays. From the perspective of modern science, it doesn't fit into recognized theories and concepts of world structure. However, this doesn't prevent supernatural phenomena from happening in our life. Moving objects with the power of thought, miraculous cases of healing, reading thoughts and transmitting images at a distance. These phenomena are manifested in people regardless of race, nationality and place of residence. They do not give rest to researchers for many decades. Unusual and even supernatural abilities appear in people at different stages of their life and for various inexplicable reasons. In some people, such abilities are manifested in childhood as a kind of innate gift, while in others they appear as a result of stressful situations. Or, they are manifested after a long training and purposeful study of various psychotechniques, meditations and spiritual practices. However, even without knowing where this came from and what the nature of their gift is, those who possess super abilities use those powers without even being aware of how they work. Although a manifestation of such phenomena indicates that a human has certain hidden abilities of remote influence on other people and the environment. We will dedicate this series of videos to the topic of remote influence. How does it work? What makes it possible? Is there a scientific justification for this phenomenon? And what is the physics of this process? We will also try to answer the questions of what supernatural abilities are inherent in a human and what knowledge and practices exist to unfold these abilities. Nowadays, the topic of contactless combat has unfortunately been discredited by charlatans of various kinds, who thus wanted to attract attention to their personas on the internet by inventing new unusual fighting techniques. So now, this is what most people associate contactless combat with. Such would-be masters are usually very easy to recognize. They will never tell you about the origin of their system. It is usually based solely on super insights or pseudo-enlightenment and has no historical foundation, transmission line and so on. 
While at their training courses, they tell amazing nonsense about some unreal energy vortices, the energies of Venus, Mars, and Jupiter, and things like that. Such courses are usually intended for those who don't want to work hard, but want to come, bow down to a master three times, and receive power through his touch. Therefore, we should say right away that our film is not about all these masters of super energetic kicks. Our film is about real contactless combat, examples of which have been known to humankind since remote antiquity, and the echoes of which we hear to this day. What is the mechanism of a strike at a distance and its energy side? What makes it happen? What skill plays a key role at the moment of a strike? And how should you train to be able to work with energy techniques at all? In this film, we will show you examples of masters of ancient and modern times. We will also refer to ancient treatises from which we will learn about energy that plays an important role in striking at a distance. Of course, there will be skeptics for whom the philosophy of ancient times is merely superstition and mysticism. However, we believe that a true researcher must understand experiences of the past in order to draw conclusions in the present and not mistake glass for diamond and ashes for gold. History has preserved references to the great masters of antiquity, who amazed people around them with their unusual skills and their power of spirit, and inspired others to explore the secrets of their inner nature. How did they manage to do what they were doing? And what practices helped them to discover in themselves what is inaccessible to an ordinary person? Certainly, when we speak about martial arts, the first thing that comes to mind is the East the birthplace of many fighting techniques and legendary masters who demonstrated extraordinary qualities of spirit and phenomenal abilities. Their art left its imprint in the destinies of many people and served as an example for many generations. One of such people was Bodhidharma, a legendary figure, the founder of Zen Buddhism and the art of Kung Fu. It was exactly Bodhidharma who turned the Shaolin Monastery into the Shaolin we know nowadays. All martial arts under heaven originated from Shaolin. A Chinese saying. Monks from the Shaolin Monastery in China are widely known across the world for their legendary Kung Fu. They became characters of many movies, books and legends about monks who are able to resist an army of armed soldiers with bare hands, without any armor. The Shaolin Monastery, translated as the Monastery of a Young New Forest, was built in the year 495 on Mount Songshan that was considered a holy place. Hermits came there to seclude themselves for spiritual practices, and there they attained immortality. In the year 520, the legendary Bodhidharma visited Shaolin, where he founded the first schools of Chan Buddhism. He also made a major contribution to the development of Shaolin Monastery, passing on to the monks a set of exercises, later called Demo Yin Jing Jing, which can be translated as a canon of muscle and tendon change, or a canon of muscle transformation, or simply Bodhidharma Qigong. This set of exercises is one of the most famous systems among the Shaolin methods of strengthening one's own body and attaining a strength of spirit. For a long time, it was considered the greatest secret of the Shaolin Monastery. It's 
it's a basic workout complex with which training in the Shaolin internal tradition begins. Since ancient times, it was believed that development of phenomenal abilities of one's body and spirit begins with the acquisition of a skill of working with Qi energy, an ability to accumulate and to replenish it, to learn not to interfere with its smooth flow, keeping Qi at rest. Thanks to the skill of working with Qi energy, Shaolin monks manifest abilities beyond the limits of a human body. For instance, by concentrating Qi energy in their limbs, Shaolin monks can break stones as well as withstand heavy strikes with various objects. In the famous Shaolin treatise Chen Ching, it is written, the median Qi should guide all movements being concentrated in the center of your body. Qi should follow the movements of your hands. Remember that the exchange of Qi is paramount. Qi is ejected from the four limbs. At the same time, Qi should always be at rest. In order to subdue Qi and learn to control it, first of all, monks are required to discipline their thoughts, to acquire a skill of focusing attention, and to develop inner peace. Indeed, differences between the techniques and skills of a Shaolin fighter and any other fighter, even a professional athlete, can be seen with the naked eye. Are their abilities just a matter of technique or special exercises? It is obvious that in this case, working with energy, namely the Tsi energy, actually plays an important role. We will return to the topic of Tsi and its role in the skill of striking at a distance a little later. Whereas now, it is interesting to discover whether there are masters of contactless combat in Shaolin nowadays. I'm Cantonese. Originally from Meizhou, Hakka. It is the birthplace of Hakka martial arts. When I was very young, seven or eight years old, I practiced a little bit together with my father. Later, when I was a teenager, I went to the Shaolin Temple, or the Wudang Mountain, thanks to my own efforts and faith. In Wudang, they focus on Tsi practice, Taijichuan practice, exactly on a gentle system. Whereas Shaolin is mainly a place where they practice foreign boxing and tough qigong. Considering these differences, I eventually chose Wudang. People with this ability do exist. But most of what you can see in the market is not true. I've heard many such stories, and I met a lot of such people. For instance, one can really burn paper on his palms, but most often, it's a hoax. A few years ago, maybe five or six, there was a Nichu boy in Nepal. You may have heard about this guy who was sitting under a tree and meditating, and then spontaneously burnt his clothes. I've seen the video. I haven't seen it in reality. But I think it's true. It's not a fake. There are people in China who have such an ability. But people with this kind of abilities don't usually flaunt them. Those are either extrasensory abilities or certain abilities developed through one's inner work.
Bodhidharma's name is associated with the traditions of Kung Fu and Tai Chi martial arts which have been preserved and developed not only in the Shaolin Monastery, but also in many other oriental schools of martial arts for 1500 years. These trends involve systematic work with energy and development of extrasensory abilities, such as foresight and clairvoyance. Among them, there are traditions of energy contactless combat. A contemporary Korean martial arts master, Song Park, founder of the Kiaido system, says the following. Among the systems of energy contactless combat, there are three major types. The first is breaking the chain intention impulse action. In order to do that, a fighter must catch the moment when his opponent starts this chain at the intention impulse stage and cut it off with an unexpected movement or sound. The second type is energy bypassing. When a fighter feels where his opponent's striking energy flow is directed and simply retreats, bypasses this flow or goes along with it. Outwardly, it looks like a simple avoidance of a strike, although it is not that simple at all. The third type is an actual energy block, when an opponent's strike is hampered by an invisible wall. All three methods require extrasensory abilities but of different degrees. The third method is especially difficult and dangerous for the one who defends himself. For a certain while, I performed demonstrations of energy blocking of strikes during training, but I ended up having a serious illness. Excessive concentration of energy entails consequences. Now I only work with the first two methods. Originally, martial arts were certainly associated with the development of willpower, discipline of thought, and training of one's spirit, and served as a supplement to spiritual evolvement of a warrior or a monk. The basis of training was development of concentration and purity of thoughts, attainment of inner peace and harmony. As for superpowers, they were merely a side effect of how perfectly a master acquired self-discipline and subdued his mind and body. However, there was also a dark, even magical side of martial arts. There were trends that used all sorts of dirty techniques, hypnosis, suggestion, manipulation, and other ways of influence on the consciousness of an opponent. Unlike the true masters of martial arts, those practitioners use qi energy, a destructive energy, the energy of death. One of the examples of those who used destructive energy was the ninjas. They were nicknamed Demons of the Night, and they lived up to this name. There are numerous legends of the martial arts of ninjas. They were believed to have an ability to jump to great heights, pass through walls, fly in the air, breathe underwater, not burn in the fire, pass by an enemy, being virtually invisible, and win at any cost. However, their main weapon was to influence the mind of their opponent and instill fear in the enemy. Ninja teaching consists of two approaches – Qing and Qi – direct and indirect violence. Qing refers to a brutal suppression of an opponent through direct physical violence, but a more subtle art for the ninjas was to overpower an enemy without entering a fight with him. For doing that, ninjas used a qi technique, a technique of indirect violence by influencing a person's consciousness. Originally, the term qi referred to a powerful destructive energy. Qi is what destroys all living things. Every ninja was obliged to become a master of controlling this energy. Influencing one's consciousness Ninjas who specialized in defeating the enemy's most vulnerable point, his consciousness, were known as senins, masters of consciousness. The technique of senin jutsu, or the technology of manipulating consciousness, enabled a ninja, skilled in this technique, 
to competently manipulate and channel necessary information, causing it to penetrate an enemy's brain faster and more accurately than an ice pick would do. We will focus on directly attacking the minds of our enemies while strengthening our psychic abilities with countless exercises on concentration and meditation to further focus our consciousness. It's a quote from the book The Nine Holes of Death, Ninja Secrets of Mind Mastery by Ha Ha Lung. Applying the technique of Yugen Shinjutsu, which means mysterious mind. In this technique, hypnosis, subconscious suggestion and other methods are used for influencing and controlling other people's consciousness. Senens used such methods on both friends and enemies in order to darken the minds of their victims and obtain the information they needed. Moreover, when we are able to successfully penetrate the brain of our opponent to first unravel his intentions and then defeat him, not with a poisoned dagger, but through instilling doubts and defeatist attitudes into his superstitious brain. This is also the ninja way. A quote from the book The Nine Holes of Death, Ninja Secrets of Mind Mastery by Ha Ha Lung. Ninjas were not the only ones who used techniques to influence other people's consciousness as part of their arsenal. Similar methods of influence were used by other warriors on different continents. For instance, by the Karakternik Cossacks. Karakterniks were Zaporozhian Cossacks who possessed special magic techniques and supernatural abilities and were able to apply them in practice during battle. One of the best-known Karakterniks was the chief ataman of Zaporozhian Sich, Ivan Serko. According to legends, they were not only knowledgeable mages, healers and excellent warriors, but also possessed various abilities such as weather control, remote influence on the enemy and manipulation of space and time. Karakternik Cossacks were the army elite and mentors. Ordinary men called them sorcerers, while priests believed that they were possessed by demons. Napoleon I once said, Had I just 10,000 Cossacks, I would have conquered the whole world. There are myths where Karakterniks defeated their enemies remotely bringing enemy troops into a state of confusion, panic and fear. Therefore, there were also called haze casters, who were able to cast a haze or a mist on the consciousness of people and animals. There is an opinion that they had knowledge of information and its programs and could hack protection of any object, plant viral programs called haze and switch to direct control of other people's bodies. Thus, a Karakternik master may be compared to a modern hacker, but the one penetrating and infiltrating not hardware and software, but the biocomputer of human bodies. History keeps silent about the mysteries of the enigmatic supernatural art of Karakternik Cossacks. There are several versions. The first one is that it's a synonym of the word sorcerers, meaning people who had super abilities. Another version is that this term originates from Sanskrit, where hara means divine power, while Harakternik is the one who possesses this divine power, meaning its bearer. On the other hand, this Sanskrit word is translated as a warrior. There is also a version that this word is derived from the Punjabi language, where the word hara means god, a deity. Besides, there are synonyms originating from the word Haralujni. Haralujni means strong, steel hard. But this theory is most likely far-fetched because this adjective was used specifically for weapons. It may be applied to a saber or a knife, but it wasn't normally applied to a human. Moreover, there is a version that the word Haraktornik came from the Greek word character. Those were people who had a certain peculiarity. In addition, it is said that Haraktornik means the one who has a great power of spirit. 
Such are the existing versions, but we don't know what the reality was. Yet, we do know that, according to legends, Harak Turnik Cossacks possess super abilities. What could the Harak Turniks do? First of all, bullets couldn't hit them. They could dodge or stop a bullet and throw it back at the enemy. They could catch cannonballs with bare hands and throw them back as well. They didn't burn in fire. They could stay underwater for long periods of time. Apart from that, there are legends, a lot of legends, that Harak Turniks could turn into wolves, somewhat similarly to Anamaji. There was such an expert in local history as Yakov Novitsky who collected these kinds of legends. Precisely in the territory of Zaporizhia, numerous legends were collected, where people testified that Harak Turniks not only turned into wolves or cats, but could turn other people into animals as well, and all sorts of evil spirits obeyed them. They could cast a haze. Haze is basically hypnosis. They could hypnotize people. Such cases did take place. They hypnotized their enemies. They could put people into sleep. From all the existing legends, I can conclude that, first of all, Harak Turniks were a closed group. They were part of the Zaporizhia army. As we have ascertained, as for their training methods, they haven't been preserved. Yet, certain indications suggest that not everyone was admitted to the Harak Turnik group. Only people who potentially had such abilities could be admitted. So here we most likely encounter the same things as in witchcraft and other energy knowledge. I mean, either this kind of knowledge was passed on as a family inheritance, or an external disciple was searched for. For example, there was a described case when Cossacks went on a military campaign in a small group and saw enemies. The enemies were more numerous. The Cossacks stuck their spears with their shafts upright, set them around themselves, gathered into the circle center, and the enemies thought it was just a little forest. Such was the haze. Moreover, Harak Turnik Cossacks could do the following. A few of them went out to fight, while their enemies thought there were several thousand of them, and the enemies simply retreated. Sometimes Harak Turniks influence people in such a way that their enemies began to see enemies in each other and fought among themselves. On the other hand, there are also records that Harak Turniks could resurrect or kill a person by means of certain rites. There are mentions that Harak Turniks themselves had a very hard time dying. They could even die more than once. Judging by the legends, there was a case when a Harak Turnik Cossack died. The earth did not accept him, so he resurrected, languished for several months, and then died again. And that happened up to four times. We know that the same happens to witches. Their transition to the other world is very tough, and there are specific procedures. Zaporizhia people also noted that when a Harak Turnik died, no priest was allowed to visit him. Only the Harak Turniks themselves gathered, conducted certain rituals and, I quote, buried him in their own way. It wasn't a cemetery because cemeteries are consecrated areas. Harak Turniks were buried in unconsecrated areas because they had superpowers. People were afraid that some force could raise them up or resurrect them. Therefore certain precautions were taken. What kind of precautions? A stake was stuck into a Cossack's chest. He was buried with his face down, and the tendons under his knees were cut. Why? Because those Cossacks had tremendous power. And if such a person would resurrect or rise, there would be very serious negative consequences. Well, history shows us, as always, that there are those who use their potential for good, standing up for people, but there are always those who use their abilities to hurt others. Creation and destruction are the two sides of one coin. As our subscriber once wrote in the comments, both sides should be known, but only one of them should be served. The first confirmation 
of the possibility of striking at a distance, captured on film, appeared in the modern world thanks to the founder of Aikido, Morihei Uyashiba. Morihei Uyashiba is one of the most outstanding representatives of martial arts in the 20th century history and the founder of Aikido in its modern form. He successfully synthesized the achievements of various schools, generalized the centuries-old experience of martial arts in Japan, improved many well-known techniques, bringing them into a coherent system, and created the philosophy, psychology, and ethics of Aikido based on the synthesis of several religious teachings – Shintoism, Buddhism, and others. In O Sensei's time, only masters who already had impressive experience in other martial arts were allowed to study Aikido. Thus, Aikido became an excellent humanized supplement to the skills which a master already possessed. Along with the technical arsenal, a practitioner received a philosophy about the value of human life and the need to preserve it. In other words, he received everything that was originally embedded in all martial arts but over the years had been lost, forgotten, or erased. The main principle of Aikido as a system of self-defense is to use the power ki, of one's opponent against himself. In the book The Art of Peace, Morihei Uyashiba notes the role of ki energy in achieving good results in training. There are two types of ki – ordinary ki and true ki. Ordinary ki is coarse and heavy while true key is light and mobile. In order to achieve success, you must free yourself from ordinary key and imbue your organs with true key. This is the foundation of a powerful technique. Morihei Yushiba practiced contactless combat at a rather advanced age, and, as people say, he never refused to demonstrate his art. There are numerous black and white records of the master throwing around with a single wave of his hand his students during training and seminars, as well as other curious opponents. Unfortunately, not all of Uyashiba's abilities were recorded on film. We learn about some of them only from the memories of his disciples. For instance, a case is described where Morihei Uyashiba's disciples asked him, to show them the ninja art of instant evasion of strikes. After the master had dodged their attack at a wind speed and instantly appeared in the remote part of the gym, he said, when a man really cherishes a dream of killing another man, his own life shortens by five to ten years. Despite the fact that Morihei Yushiba created a new and unique trend in martial arts, no other masters similar to him appeared in this art. Obviously, even his disciples were unable to adopt all the experience Yushiba had possessed, such as the technique of a contactless strike. A legend says that at the time there were simply no worthy ones to convey this knowledge to. Therefore, much of what Morihei Yushiba knew and was able to do was not continued, but passed away along with him. A couple of decades later, records of Chinese Tai Chi masters showing their skills began to appear on cassette tapes. One of the famous Chinese Tai Chi Chuan masters of that time was Shi Ming. Similar to the legendary Tai Chi teachers of the past, Shi Ming's mastery of Tui Shou bordered on magic. His opponents flew up in the air from a slight movement of his hand, bounced back five or ten meters from one turn of his pelvis, loins, or torso. According to Tai Chi Chuan principles, this happens without the use of force. Master Shi Ming practiced Tai Chi Chuan for 53 years and devoted his entire life to its study. Tai Chi Chuan, the great ultimate fist, is a Chinese internal martial art, one of the types of wushu. It is more commonly practiced nowadays as a set of recreational breathing exercises. In Shi Ming's opinion, Tai Chi Chuan represents an application of the principle of restraining movements through peace. 
Thus, peace is used for controlling movements, or that which is soft overcomes what is hard. In one of his interviews, Shi Ming said, During Tui Show, the difference between me and my opponent is that I find peace in my movements, while my opponent loses himself in the movement. Tai Chi Chuan is based on the principle that C, mind, attention, and body manifest themselves simultaneously. In essence, it's a dynamic meditation aimed at working with C energy. It is no surprise that demonstrations of such phenomenal abilities launched a huge wave of interest in this phenomenon. Many people were impressed by the videos of Tai Chi masters and went looking for teachers and any ways to learn this art so as to develop phenomenal abilities in themselves. Certainly, finding true practitioners is something almost unrealistic. After all, in China, for example, those very Tai Chi techniques were passed on within narrow confines of this tradition or exclusively through the family line. We started searching for people who had a skill at least somewhat similar to an energy strike at a distance. It turned out that nowadays there are still monasteries where they teach how to develop extrasensory abilities. We managed to talk to a man who had spent almost 20 years in Tibet, studying Kung Fu, Qigong and various methods of mind control. This man is Master Wolf. By the time I was 11 or 12, I already started to look into psychology, um, spirituality, occultism. So one thing led to another and I ended up studying Kung Fu under a Chinese master. He was a uh, iron shirt master, iron palm, in Australia. After two years, I was told that I was seriously broken inside spiritually and I, I will never ever be, be able to reach where I want to reach in that state. So he gave me a letter of introduction and sent me off to the Himalayas uh, where I met a Sherpa and the Sherpa took me up to a temple and that's where I was from 1974. I was ordained as a monk in 1975 at the age of 14 or 15 and that's where I was till 1988. And then uh, many things happened and uh, the Chinese army came in and started to attack the monks in my monastery. Um, I was tortured and hung a few times. <laughs> and that's basically where it all started for me. No further comments. Just look what he demonstrates in his videos. So when it comes to remote influence, you are already everywhere. But our education creates the delusion that we are all separate individual fragments of one life, and therefore we are not connected. And because everybody believes that and thinks that way, they can't see how ESP is possible. They can't see how telekinesis is possible. Because how? How can you do that if you're not connected? And therefore, it creates a dumbing down of people's spiritual powers. Once you know and realize and understand and have experienced that the mind that you are is in all things, then it's easy. Moving your finger is no different to moving a glass of water or um, a bottle or anything for that matter. Like that, for instance, the universe is one living entity and the mind of that entity is in all things. We call it awareness. And that is why you can influence everything. You are already everything. And there's the ego and there's the spirit. The ego is what thinks it's you and what you now think is it. 
The spirit is whatever you are in there that is aware of those thoughts. Now, you're aware of when you're thinking and you are aware of when you are not thinking. So you obviously aren't your thoughts. You know when you're thinking and you know when you're not thinking. So knowing has nothing to do with thought either. So what the hell are you using them for? And once you have stopped thinking that you are separate to all things, once you see and have demonstrated to yourself that you are in all things, then moving another object is no different to moving your finger. Why can you move your finger without thinking? Because you don't see it as being separate from you. You don't have a concept of thinking that this is a separate thing to you. Therefore, you just move it because it is a part of you. When you look at a glass or a bottle or something that you wish to move, all you have to do is get rid of your thought process and come straight from your knowing. So get rid of the middleman, get rid of the thought process and just come straight from your knowing. Then your life is being ruled by spirit. Then your life is not being marked or screwed up by wrong education. And then you will have all the skills that you're talking about. It's that simple. It's a pity that Master Wolf is far away. So we didn't have a chance to see everything with our own eyes. That's why no definite conclusions can be drawn in this case. As the saying goes, I want to believe. Yet, the nature of Master Wolf's remote influence on objects is more similar to telekinesis. Even logically, it is clear that moving an object with the power of thought and striking a person with energy are based on different principles. It is interesting to hear Master Wolf's explanation of that. Distance strike, you know, there is some videos when the people are standing on the big distance with, with the guy, he's, he's moving his body, and then you see that, that someone becomes the strike. Is it the same nature, like the distance flowing uh, influence? Uh, is it the same, the same nature, like uh, for a distance healing or some something, some key, uh, things from the magic, like curses? Uh, also, or is is it something something different? It's something different. It's chi and what they call chi energy. None of these things really have a name. Uh, it is focused. Now, when you focus universal love in a beam, you have chi, or what we call chi. And you can push, you can pull, you can heal, you can do all sorts of things. But if you see your chi as being a special magical force that you have developed, you never, ever... I mean, how many so-called chi masters are in the world and none of them are doing what you would expect to do if you had those powers? <laughs> and that they all end up dying of being stabbed or something. Anyway, that's what it is, chi. It's a focused form of love. It connects you to the thing that you wish to manipulate. And once you've made a connection with something, it becomes you, and then you can work with it, just like eating an apple. So if I focus my chi and put my chi into you, I now have a connection. We are literally connected, just like me and my finger is connected. At that point, I can heal you in the same way I can do this with my hand, because I'm connected, and that's love. Anything that connects anything is love, a form of love. It's important to clarify that in fact, Xi and Qi are different names, different pronunciations of the same energy. And it's interesting that we find this word in the names of martial arts and healing practices as an indication of the key role of this energy. The martial art of Aikido and the oriental healing practice Reiki have a key syllable in their names as a major element which they are based upon. Master Wolf wasn't the only expert we turned to for comments. We also had a conversation about key energy with a Reiki master, Hayukatin Inamoto. Reiki means the energy of the universe. And sometimes I say the energy of heaven, 
and the earth. Okay? But in modern term, you know, we use the universe. So again, simply put, Reiki is the energy of the universe which sustain all life. All life means not only human, animal, plant, all living things, all, you know, uh, life. Okay? Uh, that's uh, the meaning of Reiki. Okay? So again, simply put, it's the energy of the universe which sustains all life. But usually, we are not aware of this energy because it's so natural, so common. We just take it as granted. The centuries-old history of Oriental martial arts shows that, at all times, true masters paid special attention to working with Z energy. And this tradition keeps living up to our time despite anything. Hence, training one's body and spirit with the help of Z energy demonstrated its effectiveness. So what kind of energy is that? Which of the known types of energy is C? Or is it a kind of energy that is so far unknown to us? How can a person develop additional abilities in himself and exert remote influence by means of C energy? What is C? The etymological meaning of C is vapor over boiling, sacrificial rice. Si is one of the fundamental categories in Chinese philosophy, a universal substance of the universe. It expresses the idea of a dynamic, spatio-temporal, spiritual and material and vital energy substance. Si is pneuma, ether, atmosphere, gas, air, breath, temperament, energy and vitality. In Chinese philosophy, there was a generally recognized idea of Tsi as a quality-free primary substance of which the universe consisted at the initial phase of its development, called chaos, Handan, the great limit, Tai Chi, or the great one, Tai Yi. Tsi was first mentioned in the treatise Go Yu, Speeches of the Kingdoms, the authorship of which is attributed to Confucius's disciple Zhou Tzu Ming, who compiled it on the basis of earlier chronicles. It is interesting that the first mention of Tsi energy is associated with an explanation of the causes of earthquakes. Thus, in the Go Yu treatise, a dignitary of Zhu Kingdom explained earthquakes by a violation of the order of interaction between the Tsi energies of heaven and earth. Tsi energies of heaven and earth must not break their sequence. If the sequence is not observed, that will cause confusion among people. The light nature Yang is at the bottom and cannot go outside. The dark nature Yin suppresses it and does not allow it to rise up. That's what causes earthquakes. In the Chinese philosophical systems, Tsi energy plays a tremendous role in the inner spiritual transformation of a human. In the teaching of Taoist inner alchemy, it is believed that by nurturing Tsi through practices, a person becomes resilient and resolute towards physical and mental hardships he encounters during his lifetime. And that with the help of this energy, one can even achieve immortality. In his work, The Way of Gold and Vermilion, Taoist Practices and Studies and Translations, Yevgeny Torchinov, researcher of religions, Sinologist, Buddhologist, historian of Chinese philosophy and culture, gives the following information about sea energy in Taoist philosophy. Ancient Chinese philosopher and skeptic Wang Chang, while discussing the nature of Tsi, gave an example that may be regarded as classic. When Tsi condenses, it becomes matter. And when it gets subtler, it turns into spirit, just like ice turns into water and water turns into vapor when they are heated. Everything existing in the world is Tsi, and there is nothing else except Tsi and its states. Subtle, rarefied Tsi is spirit. Condensed Tsi is substance. Tsi represents powerful flows of vital force, life energy, which permeate and shape the entire universe. A human lives in sea like fish lives in water, as Taoists often say. 
However, C is not only around a human. Most importantly, it is also in a human himself, meaning C in the narrow sense of this word, as life energy or vital force. C circulates throughout our body via the energy channels, Jing, filling every cell, every organ, every bone or muscle with life. Chinese philosopher Yang Fu explained the Western term ether as the name of the purest Tsi. Present-day Chinese researchers such as Feng Tsi and others associate Tsi with the concept of a field. A little bit later, we will tell you how you can learn to focus attention and to work with Tsi energy. And we'll provide a description of techniques for performing some meditative practices. Whereas now, Let's figure out what this energy is and what its role is in contactless combat and in a preparatory training for it. Over the entire history of Chinese philosophy and up to nowadays, there have accumulated numerous and different interpretations of what Tsi energy is. Some philosophers added their own understanding, tried to introduce something new, and eventually this term became covered with more and more interpretations which caused an ultimate confusion. At some point, in various schools, the creative Tsi energy and the energy of destruction, Qi, began to be regarded as identical, and these terms began to be used as synonyms. Although originally, they meant energies which are opposite in their functions. This is also an interesting point. What gives energy the properties of creation or destruction? It turns out that energy may be not just featureless, but can be used to fulfill certain functions, though having its own individual characteristics. So what is Tsi? It is definitely clear that this concept denoted a certain primeval creating power, permeating the universe. Similar interpretations of the primeval energy, which is the basis of everything, existed at different times among various peoples. Fluid, Ki, Tsi, Prana, Reiki, Mana, and a number of others all refer to the breath that sustains the universe. The most common definition of Tsi energy is the energy of breath. According to Chinese philosophy, Si is the energy that a human receives from the air. Let's reflect on this subject a little bit. If the energy Si is of unknown nature and its existence is confirmed by thousands of years of experience and practice of those people who knew how to operate it, then what is this energy in fact? The chemical composition of air is known to many people since secondary school classes. 98% of it represents a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. It turns out that in the process of our breathing, we receive Tsi, concentrate it, direct it, and so on. But what do we actually concentrate? What is Tsi in this mixture of gases that we inhale? Perhaps it's oxygen. Yes. Oxygen is vitally important, and we cannot live long without it. But carbon dioxide is vitally important too. Therefore, what matters is not a particular gas, but something much deeper. If nitrogen and oxygen molecules make up the basis of air, this means they are supposed to disintegrate and give this energy. Yet, has anyone studied this process? And what is behind it? What makes those molecules divide, live and exist? And where is the Tsi energy hiding? Is it in the molecules? Or maybe it is the energy that forms molecules of the air, as well as deeper constituents. This is what we don't know yet. One thing is clear. The nature of this energy is apparently much further and deeper beyond elementary particles and molecules. The main known kinds of energy on Earth are chemical, radiant, thermal, gravitational, kinetic, electric, and nuclear. Which of these may be Tsi? Or is it an unknown kind of energy yet undiscovered by humankind? There is a good term which was introduced relatively recently. It is Vril. This term encompasses all kinds of energy that we cannot see. 
starting from the energy through which particles interact among themselves, and up to the one used by mages and psychics in their practices. What is Vril? I should call it electricity, except that it comprehends in its manifold branches other forces of nature, to which in our scientific nomenclature differing names are assigned, such as magnetism, galvanism and so on. These people consider that in Vril they have arrived at the unity in natural energetic agencies, which has been conjectured by many philosophers above ground. These subterranean philosophers assert that by one operation of Rill, they can influence the variations of temperature, in plain words, the weather, that by operations applied scientifically through Vril conductors, they can exercise influence over minds and bodies, animal and vegetable. To an extent not surpassed in the romances of our mystics. To all such agencies, they give the common name of Vril. Further in our research for convenience and so as not to be confused in terms, we will use the name Vril. The main question is different though. What is a person who has mastered Vril capable of? And how can one learn to control this power? After all, it's a proven fact that there are those who can do that. And this is really interesting. Well, we promised you real contactless combat. So let's proceed to it. Now we are going to watch footage from the video, an ordinary day in our life. It was filmed by ordinary guys who have restored the true spirit of Shaolin in their own backyard. As you can see, they have homemade training equipment. Moreover, their exercises themselves are quite unconventional, such as, for instance, dragging a log, punching a round makiwara, made of dense wood and covered with a soccer ball leather, or working with a bag filled with gravel. As the guys themselves say, they need such exercises as a preparation for further working with energies in order to learn how to accumulate power, distribute it correctly, and consequently be able to strike objects from any distance. Surely many of you have heard about contactless combat or the so-called punches at a distance. But what we are going to show you now is something much more interesting and most importantly it is real. This will be a little element of the old Lama style. Well, those of our viewers who hear about this style for the first time can learn more about it from the books by Anastasia Novik. You have to understand that a physical punch doesn't differ much 
from the punch that you have just seen. For this punch, the distance doesn't matter. Whether an object is even on the top of a mountain, in a submarine, in some bunker, or on the other side of the globe, it absolutely doesn't matter. The only thing needed is an image of the object. To make it more clear, you can consider this to be a transfer of information. As for those viewers who want to delve deeper into the essence of this process, you can learn about it from the primordial Alatra physics report. When we were visiting the guys and discussing the topic of striking at a distance, I realized that there are several ways of striking. Impact on an object may be direct and indirect. The impacts are somewhat similar, but at the same time, there are substantial differences. I suggest listening to what the ways of striking at a distance are and how this mechanism works in general. Obviously, striking at a distance is an energy process. As we mentioned earlier, a master transfers information onto a specific object by means of its image. In other words, the image of an object is the address of delivery of a strike. What does a master do? He visualizes, imagines a person whom he wants to strike, focuses on this image, and strikes. Thus, a strike takes place, first of all, at the energy level, and then it descends to the physical plane. For such a strike, one doesn't have to imitate movements of arms and legs, which we often see during demonstrations. It's just a way of focusing on what is happening. So, if an image is a delivery address, then there has to be a road along which a parcel can be transported to that address. What could that road be? It's a certain physical medium that transmits such an influence instantaneously at any distance. And by the way, for this kind of medium, it doesn't matter where an object is located. Even if an object is located, for instance, in a bunker or in another protected place, it wouldn't help one to hide from such a strike. Moreover, this fact indicates that everything in our universe is interconnected. What is visualization of an image in one's head? It is basically a creation of a phantom that will contain information about a real object. During a strike, energy is instantly transferred from this phantom to the physical plane. By the way, for this very reason, masters of contactless combat can get beaten by an ordinary boxer. I guess you've seen a situation when a master of contactless combat demonstrates his technique, and he's doing perfectly well. But as soon as he enters the ring, he loses, not having time to deliver his trademark blow. Why does this happen? Because a master of contactless combat works with a phantom. He doesn't work with the physical body of an opponent. And the opponent's physical body is not an image. Therefore, a master of contactless combat needs time to concentrate and to create a phantom. And this phantom will be an intermediary through which the master will transfer his energy to the opponent, which will later on affect the physical plane. That is why it cannot happen so that a master of contactless combat would go out into the street, flash lightning from his eyes, and scatter everyone around. By the way, Today, we mentioned two different principles of striking at a distance. There is a direct and an indirect strike. Those masters who use an image for striking apply the indirect method. And there is a method that was demonstrated to you. But this method is extremely energy-consuming, even too energy-consuming. Unfortunately, we won't be able to talk about it in detail. I think you have seen when in their schools, masters of contactless combat demonstrate simply amazing techniques on their students, throwing them around. And they are so good at that. And you might have a question, 
How come? How do they do that? The answer to this question is very simple. Masters and their students are connected in one energy field. Their energy structures are linked, and a master absorbs a student with his field when he works with him. When a student is in his master's field, the master can do anything with his field, with his power. Therefore, they are so good at all that. There is also another very interesting nuance which we learned from magic. In order to be able to strike a person at a distance, to influence him, the person's consent is needed. If a person doesn't agree to such an action, it's impossible to strike him. Yet, you may come up with another question. How can it happen that a person is sitting at home, for example, lying on a couch, without suspecting any influence at all? He doesn't want to be struck, but at the same time, a strike takes place. It happens for two reasons. The first one is that a person can tritely be open to that strike. Well, the second reason is that if a person doesn't agree and doesn't want to be struck, just like a boxer in the ring who comes out and doesn't really agree to be hit, in this case, a master needs to work a little bit more. He needs to spend more time and effort to create a phantom that would agree to be struck. A master implants this phantom into a person, into his energy structure. And in this case, in order for this to work, the master's energy, the master's power, must exceed the power of the victim. Otherwise, nothing will work out either. But how can a strike at a phantom image generated in one's head actually take place and reach its target? How is a person's image connected with the person himself? Essentially, referring to what Master Wolf was talking about at the beginning of our film, we are all connected. Everything in the universe is interconnected, and distance is an illusion. When we talk about remote influence, we have to understand that we talk about a completely different picture of the world than it appears to our ordinary consciousness. I mean, we live in the material world, and it seems to us that we are material objects, that we can touch each other. And when we touch each other, we will somehow affect each other. But in reality, this isn't true. As a matter of fact, everything that exists around us is emptiness. That is, you and I are empty. We only seem to be such material objects. Why is that so? Because we are quantum objects. While quantum objects are electrons, photons, protons, in reality, this is emptiness. Let's say, the number of particles relative to the volume of the space they occupy is very small. Therefore, those perceptions of the material world which we are accustomed to are wrong. You see, this is the first level of perception, this is the level of Newtonian physics. But in fact, we now already understand that the picture of the world is much deeper. Simultaneously with that kind of perception of a material body, there is a totally different perception, a perception of another space, another level of exchange between systems. Nowadays, quantum physics describes this quite well. That is why everything that we would say about consciousness, about the influence of human beings on each other, it all relates to a completely different field, I would even say, of not physics, but science. I mean, science now only begins to understand this field. And this field covers not just consciousness and not only our influence on each other, but a lot of other effects. This includes the existence of consciousness after death, the existence of some entities which we actually do not understand either. These are also various kinds of creatures flying in space, which can sometimes be detected, but not always. So, you see, this is the world which we are only starting to touch a little bit. And serious scientists finally begin to look at it without a wry smile claiming that it is all quackery and pseudoscience.
I'm sure that in this century, in the 21st century, we will make great progress in this direction. Therefore, everything that relates to healing and remote influence, it all relates to a different view of reality. Let's hope that quantum physics will soon give us answers to all questions regarding remote influence. In the meantime, let's return to the topic of images. There remains a final question. If creating an image plays a key role in striking at a distance, then what is C energy needed for? A strike itself represents a transfer of charge, and C energy plays a crucial role here because it is precisely C that creates an energy charge. If there is no charge, a strike simply won't work. That's why a master, like a capacitor, accumulates C energy with every inhale. And when he accumulates enough charge, he can then transfer it to an image, a phantom, which he is connected to. Creation of an image, its implantation into the energy structure of another person and transfer of a charge is actually called real controlled magic. Just think of how much energy a master should spend to create a phantom to implant it into a person's energy structure and to transfer a charge so that this charge would affect the person's physical component and how much time one should spend on learning that. And the main question is, is it really worth it? The task of a master of contactless combat is not only to strike an opponent, but also to subdue his consciousness. In order to fulfill this task, a master should, first of all, be able to control his own consciousness and have the skill of entering an altered state of consciousness from which changes in the energy plane are made. And those changes are then reflected on the physical level. In order to fulfill such tasks, a master has to unfold psychoenergy abilities in himself. Since ancient times, for many millennia, the tools for unfolding the inner power of a human and his potential included meditations and spiritual practices. What should a person do to really learn contactless combat? Only the one whose mind is calmer than that of others is the greatest fighter. She Susi. Let's turn to the legendary experience of ancient masters. Advice on maintaining inner peace and detachment from all worldly cares accompany almost every exercise performed by Shaolin monks. Meditative practices went along with physical exercises. First of all, a warrior had to purify and calm down his consciousness to detach himself from the vanity of worldly affairs, to attain spontaneity of self-manifestation of his spirit. What simple steps can any person take to learn how to do this? How is meditation properly performed? And what is the state of meditation? First of all, a proper meditation is performed in the absence of any thoughts or images, through concentration of consciousness on one point. The state of meditation is paradoxical. It combines in itself increased concentration and utmost relaxation of one's body. Moreover, mental strain is excluded, and a state of inner harmony is achieved. Before starting to perform meditations, it's important to remember that their effectiveness entirely depends on a person. For the development of a person's psychoenergy abilities, it is extremely important to set a clear goal and to maintain a special way of life aimed at preservation and economical spending of psychic energy. This implies that a person controls thoughts and emotions during the day. And how much energy he spends on inner worries or implementation of his ambitions to achieve something in the material world. In other words, if a person strives to learn to work with energies, it is essential for him to learn to save power and not to waste it on emotions. As it often happens in our everyday life, when we are preoccupied with daily routine and endless material issues. Stability is paramount 
And you will definitely have a result if you regularly perform practices, have a positive attitude, and spend energy during the day economically. Meditation can help a person to effectively cope with intrusive thoughts and depressive states, because a person learns to consciously control his attention, to invest it in what he needs, and to switch it in time, if necessary. If practices are performed regularly, your psycho-emotional state improves, you gain vigor, vivacity, and good mood. Now, we will tell you simple, elementary techniques and meditations which will help everyone who desires to learn to focus attention, calm one's consciousness, get rid of heaps of thoughts in one's head, attain a state of inner harmony and balance. As incredible as it may seem, an essential skill that significantly facilitates and accelerates attainment of results in practice is an ability to relax. Yes, it is such a simple skill, but a lot depends on it. For example, it determines whether you can stop an inner dialogue, immerse yourself in practice, and enter an altered state of consciousness. Therefore, the first exercise we are going to discuss today is the Schultz method of autogenic training. It's a basic technique you should start working with before you proceed to meditation. It is very simple to perform. You need to sit down, calm down, relax, sitting in a comfortable posture, let's say in an armchair, and give mental commands inside yourself, which your body will execute. However, you shouldn't just give these commands, but also focus your attention on the part of the body you are working with. Mental commands may be approximately the following. I am absolutely calm. My right arm is heavy. My left arm is heavy. Both arms are heavy. You can utter mental commands several times until your body masters them. And then you can move on to a more complex, full form of autogenic training. The full form of autogenic training consists of six blocks of mental commands. Over time, as a person learns to control his body by means of mental commands, the body executes these commands instantaneously. You as personality give these commands to your body. And when, let's say, you need to relax, to quickly relieve stress, you no longer need to spend a lot of time or go to some place to do that. You just need to give mental commands to your body. It will instantly execute them, and you will relax, calm down, take control of yourself, and calmly find solutions to complex problems. It's important to note that you need to focus on sensations. In no event should you strain yourself or try to evoke certain sensations in your body by force of will. You won't succeed. You will thus have no progress for a long time. What do you need? You just need to sit down, close your eyes, calm down, utter a mental command, surely direct your attention to the part of the body you are working with, and enjoy the process. Then the result will definitely come. Along with practicing autogenic training, it is really important to develop the skill of concentration. Focusing attention is a key to successful performance of any meditation and spiritual practice. Today, we will discuss a very simple yet effective practice of focusing attention and controlling Tsi energy. This meditation technique is needed for learning to control the energy of Vril. You can find a detailed description of this technique in the book by Anastasia Novik, Sensei, the Primordial of Shambhala. You need this meditation in order to learn to control the air energy, see, and to feel how this energy moves within a human. By the way, this technique will substantially help you to make your life easier. After all, attention plays a major role in human life. Where attention flows is where power flows too. How much attention do we spend during the day on all sorts of tasks? 
background thoughts, projections of the future, or memories that pop up from our memory at the most inopportune moment. We talk to someone in our head. We imagine pictures of a future that will never happen. And on all of that, we carelessly squander our vital energy and attention. By the end of the day, we can feel like a squeezed lemon. Even if we haven't had any physical activity during the day, Thus, emotions and thoughts take more of our inner energy than even the hardest physical work does. That is why such a continuous energy drain leads us to apathy, laziness, depression, and a bad mood. Even during a nighttime rest, we are unable to recover. Therefore, it is extremely important to learn to control our attention so as to invest it in something that will bring us only joy, good mood, and positive emotions. The last exercise we are going to study today will be an exercise from the aforementioned video an ordinary day in our life, where a punch at a distance is demonstrated. First of all, it is very important to learn how to focus attention. What does it mean to focus attention? There is a simple exercise. As for me, I practice it for 15 months, just for you to understand. Two times a day, 20 minutes each. You can take a piece of paper and roll it up. For example, I used empty cigarettes. It is placed at a certain height so that, let's say, you could observe it for 20 minutes without getting tired. What is this done for? In order to learn how to feel the space, and most importantly, to learn how to feel the object which we shall impact upon to feel this object in space. Yet, here we exactly have a non-physical impact, an impact through feelings. We should feel the object and impact on it. You have seen how we pull logs. This is exactly an exercise, one of the exercises in the complex of exercises, that helps to learn feeling power within oneself, to learn how to feel where this power accumulates and how to distribute it correctly. We started practicing this exercise with logs that we could move from their place. Then there's gradual weight increase. It's not necessary to start with big logs right away. You should start with those that you can move. This helps learning to feel power in oneself, learning to distribute energy without physical strength. And then there is this exercise, so it must be a complex. We do these exercises with logs not in order to learn how to hit, but to learn how to accumulate power in ourselves and distribute it properly. If we go back to the punch that remotely hit our long-suffering sparring partner, it is also important to understand that it was a one-time discharge of energy. It's like a gunshot. Yet you have to understand that this training does not tolerate any doubt. There must be discipline. Two times a day, physical exercises, and these exercises are not a physical impact, but an energy impact. It should be practiced as a complex. 
As for those very logs, regardless of the weather, the routine schedule has to be complied with. If the schedule is violated, it provokes a rollback. A failure occurs, it no longer goes at such a pace as it should go. Therefore, discipline is very important. But before you start doing this, it's important to ask yourself a question. What do you need this for? What do you need this for? That's a good question. Possessing such skills is a huge responsibility. But what if these abilities are inherent in every human being? What if we do not even realize our entire potential and the power that is embedded in us? In our consumerist format of society, it is even good that we don't know what we are capable of. Imagine if masses of people could strike others without contact or completely eliminate an object from any distance, regardless of any physical barriers. What would people do? Of course, very few would be able to resist the temptation of punishing their offender for even a minor fault. But on the other hand, the knowledge of how to control such a powerful energy can bring so much benefit to society that would open up tremendous new prospects for our civilization. There are still many open and unresolved questions, answers to which require deep fundamental global research. This film is just a small step for us to get to the essence of remote influence and discover what energies take part in it. This video episode only slightly opens the door to an unexplored world, and it is even difficult to imagine what awaits us there. A world of new opportunities, a world of new energies, or maybe not new ones, but just purposefully forgotten. How could the world be transformed if humankind unraveled those mysteries? What makes an influence at a distance possible? How can we defend ourselves against it? Striking at a distance and remote healing? What do they have in common? You will find this out in our next episodes. Stay with us.